Hello everyone, Todd Shelnett here with CFI Pro Courses and this week we're back again on Wednesday for Regulation Wednesdays and we're going to start off by reviewing the stump the chump that I gave you last week. So the question was in 91205 paragraph Bravo it mentions about the manifold pressure gauge for an altitude engine and so if your aircraft, and we, I gave you a specific airplane uh, for the instance, which was the Piper PA44-180 Seminole, the non-turbo model. And so the question was, is, it, is that a required instrument for that airplane and why? And so you had to kind of figure it out. And I gave you some hints about going to the uh, historic regs because we did talk about those. So... Let's go over to some of the documents that we have for the Seminole, and let's look at some of those documents, and I'm gonna show you about some of the historic FARs, and then we can get on to today's question. Okay, so what I have here for you is the type certificate data sheet for the Seminole, and I've highlighted some of my items here, so that way we could uh, really make some of this stuff stand out in the document. So the first thing that we want to talk about is this is the, of course, the type certificate data sheet number Alpha 19 Sierra Oscar. And if we come over here, we can see it's for the PA44-180. And that is very important. And the next important data on here is that this is for the, uh, the Seminole, which was approved on March 19, 1978. So they started making the aircraft started putting some stuff together in actually the mid to late 60s and this was when they finally got it approved. So this is what we have to go off of. And if you've ever looked at a type certificate data sheet, it talks about many different items on there like the type of engines and uh, the spinners and all the different type of equipment that go on the airplane. But we're really not concerned with that right now. I'll let you look over that in your own time. We are more concerned with the data that's down here on a couple of sheets, and I'm going to scroll down till we get to my next highlighted note because that's where we want to talk about this. So the certification basis uh, that was done uh, on March 19th, or excuse me, March 10th, 1978, and uh, you can see where they actually applied for type certification on January 17th, 1976. It took them. A little over two years to get certified by the FAA. And the part of the certification basis that we want to go look at is this first part here, which is the important part. Federal uh, uh, PA44, not the turbo down here, uh, was based off, the certification was based off the Federal Aviation Regulations Part 23, effective February 1st, 1965, because that's the, when Part 23 became effective, through Amendment 23-16, effective February 14th, 1975, and so on and so on. So this is very important for us to understand this because it's going to help us to be able to go and find the data that we need to find because we want to make sure that we're looking at the current amendments and the current guidance that was applicable at the time of this aircraft was made. So I'm going to scroll down here just a couple more things. I think one more thing here I want to show you. Um, I think it was just another note saying that in, in the equipment, here it is, the equipment on this airplane is based off the POH and FA approved AFM and that's note number VB-860. Well if you look at the uh, the Piper Seminole POH you can see that number is at the bottom. That was approved March 23rd 1978 for these serial numbers and of course each particular POH that we're looking at is for a specific lineage of the aircraft. You can see here this is actually uh, this one right here this VB1380 was approved in 1989 for those serial numbers and so on and so on. But that's not why we're here. We're trying to get all the way back to that historic data. So let's bounce on over to the regulations and then we'll come back and look at another document. All right, so I'm at the page that we talked about last session where I go to access my historical regulations or the historical code, historical CFRs, whatever you'd like to call it. Here it's called the historical CFR, so that's what I like to call it. 
I know that on my last page that I showed you that we were discussing part 23, so I want to go to part 23. And then I just did a quick search in there to figure out exactly where this would lie. And I see that it lies within 1305, the old 23.1305. So at the time of the certification, and uh, which is around 1977 here, if we're looking at this, you're going to find that it looks something like this. So this was the old 23.1305, and it looks very similar to like the 14 CFR 91.205. It looks very similar to that. Uh, however, uh, what the the if you read the the document history down here at the bottom, and they have these notice for proposed rulemaking down here, these documents that here, it explains why they have changed or why they are changing it at this particular update. So the FAA realized, if you read through all this material, the FAA realized that this actually doesn't work for every single aircraft. And so Piper was basically saying, well, I mean, should we put that, should we put that in there? I mean, I guess we need to because it says a manifold pressure gauge for each altitude engine. And there's nothing down here that says anything else beside, uh, for that. So it was really kind of confusing as to whether or not the, the, the airplane did or did not. So here you can actually see the manifold pressure gauge for each altitude engine. But as it progressed forward and more of these uh, NPRMs came through and more research was done, the regulation ended up looking like this, and this is the newer version of it, and it says a manifold pressure gauge for each altitude engine and for each engine with a controllable prop. And this is what actually set forth the whole changing of part 23 into basically what it is now. This has been, part 23 has been tweaked and tweaked and tweaked and tweaked over the years. So just a lot of uh, items that go into part 23. And down here at the bottom, this is uh, this NPRM down here at the bottom here. This is the one that explains why this happened the way it did. And I have it over here in my PDF. I'm going to open up this PDF and show you what this looked like. So this whole entire NPRM, and I'm not going to show you the whole entire thing because it's 79 pages long here. But down here at the bottom, it says that explanation, the proposal clarifies the power plant instrument requirements for separating the reciprocated engine, turbine engine, turbojet fan, and turboprop requirements and adding requirements for cooling temperature indicator, fuel low level warning, manifold pressure indicator, and chip indicator. And if we continue to read down through and we look at conference proposal 424, that is where they wanted to make that new requirement of the tachometer scale and all this other stuff they want. And here is where they said, experience in field surveys show that tachometers are not accurate enough to prevent operation in the high stress area that ultimately results, results in prop blade failures. Manifold pressure along with engine RPM is necessary for engines with controllable props to determine power settings. So here's like the birth of actually the requirement of saying this is actually required for this aircraft regardless of whether or not is it an altitude engine. And down here at the conference proposal 426 also says cylinder head limit temperatures can be exceeded by leaning the engine and manifold pressure is needed to determine power settings and avoid over boosting. And then in the end, the FAA agreed that they need to rephrase that and that's how it came back to read uh, the other way, which is the more updated one. And then they got rid of it entirely and totally rewrote uh, part 23. And so now what we ended up having uh, in the very end is something that looks very simple. And this is the brand new part here that actually took the place of that very lengthy uh, 23.1305. And here it just, it doesn't really even give anything indication about what needs to be installed. It just says, uh, installed systems must provide the flight crew member who sets or monitors parameters for the flight navigation and power plant, the information necessary to do so during each phase of flight. And this information must blah, blah, blah. So they 
stopped putting very specific things and they said, look, it just the FAA got down to it and said, look, here's the deal. You, you've got to have what you need on there in order for it to, to be flown safely. And so that's it. And that's how you can look and do the research and answer these questions. So if an examiner or something asks you a question says, is this manifold pressure gauge required? You can say absolutely that is, is required. And it is required. You have to go back to the historic uh, CFRs, you can't find it in the current data. So re regardless of whether or not that the 91205 Bravo says a manifold pressure gauge for each altitude engine, we have to go off what was done in the original uh, type certificate and you have to go to the TCDS and because it was certificated with that, it has to be in the plane. So hopefully that answers that question. Kind of a lengthy one. Kind of a lengthy one. I had a couple people message me go, man, that was a lengthy one. You know, you really made us dig into it. And I, I try not to do that a lot, but this is a question that gets asked on check rides and I think you should know it. All right, without further ado, spend enough time on that. Let's very quickly go over and let's talk about our reg of the week that we're gonna look at and that stumped a bunch of pilots for this past week. All right, so our reg, the discussion this week is brought to you by part 91 and specifically 91.51. And the question that was brought up in the check ride is the uh, person took off from a, a point flying to another point and they planned on landing with exactly 30 minutes worth of fuel remaining in the tanks uh, when they landed. And so the examiner stated that uh, when they got down there, the uh, the student uh, or the pilot wanted to fly around some of the local area and visit and they did that and they landed with only 10 minutes of fuel in the tank so the examiner wanted to know was that legal could they do that and this again was a kind of a cheap shot it's a stump the chump kind of thing and i'm going to show you exactly uh, the side of the story and which is which is a uh, uh, correct and which is not so correct so the part which is, let's actually look at uh, SIC 91.151 first, and let's look at the, uh, the title. So the title says, Fuel Requirements in, for Flight in VFR Conditions. And then it says, No person may begin a flight in an airplane under VFR conditions unless that there is enough fuel to fly to the first point of intended landing and assuming normal cruising speed during the day to fly after that for at least 30 minutes. And so the, the examiner asked the question, and the guy says, nope, can't do that, got to land with 30 minutes, and the examiner says, are you sure? And this kept bantering back and forth. Anyway, the examiner ended up in an issuing a notice of disapproval. Uh, this was the straw that broke the camel's back. It was not necessarily the only thing that the person did on the check ride. It's never just one thing. It's always a multitude of things. So here is the explanation as to why that what that situation was, was perfectly legal. Well, if you read the wording here, it says, no person may begin, no person may begin a flight in an airplane under VFR conditions unless there's enough fuel to fly to the first point. No person may begin a flight. So he did not begin a flight. He had enough fuel to go for 30 minutes past that point, and he did. He met all the requirements, therefore, Perfectly legal. Is it safe? Ah, I don't know. That's a 9113 question. I'd, I'd have to let a safety inspector uh, deal with that, whether or not he or she uh, did, says that that's safe, but that's something that you should know. And there's a lot of pilots really get this reg um, confused. And what even gets more confusing is if I scroll down here to the IFR regs, and I'm going to look at the same exact reg, which deals with the flight for uh, the fuel requirements for flight in IFR conditions. And of course, we can start looking at this reg. It kind of mimics, it goes back to uh, the, the previous reg, and which we just talked about. And it says, right off the bat, read the requirement, fuel requirements for flight in IFR conditions. So the examiner would say, it's a nice, clear, sunny day. Cavu, clear above visibility unlimited, all the way to your destination. You're going to file IFR. What's your fuel reserve? Well, fuel requirements for flight in IFR conditions. 91.167 only applies for 
IFR conditions. No person may operate a civil aircraft in, in IFR conditions unless it carries enough fuel considering weather reports and forecast and weather conditions to do this. No person may operate a civil aircraft in IFR conditions. How would we differentiate that? Well, if I'm on this trip and I only, uh, so if it's an IFR trip and there's CAVU all the way, I can actually go there and just have enough fuel on that for just to fly 30 minutes afterwards. But I would not be able to legally enter a cloud on the way to my destination or any IFR conditions for that matter, whatever they may be, uh, without the proper amount of fuel on board. So that would make me have to divert to rethink my fuel. So please make sure you're reading the regs correctly. Uh, these can actually be major problems on down the way, but the bottom line is, is that 91.167 would not apply to you if you were a VFR the entire way, but if you went into a cloud, then you would be illegal at that point because you operated an airplane in IFR conditions that did not carry enough fuel to meet all these requirements. I hope you enjoyed our Regulation Wednesday today. If you would, please take time to go ahead and like, subscribe, and click on that little bell for future notifications. I'm Todd Shelnick with CFI Pro Courses. Bye-bye.